Uh, our calling, Bonnie and mine, as uh, we go on these trips is to equip. You see, that word is used for mending fishing nets. It's used for the disciples when they were mending their nets when Jesus called them. That's the word equip. It's not going to a seminar. It's actually coming near and connecting frayed parts and broken parts. I look at it this way. I think in pictures. Bonnie and I go because missionaries slide off the road and go into the ditch, just like everybody else. Only there's not a whole church body that comes alongside them and helps them out spiritually. And if a missionary goes in the ditch in one of these stations and they stay in the ditch and their relationship with the Lord cools and their relationship with their husband or wife cools and their family begins to spiral downward, they will leave that place. Did you know it's hard enough to live here where everyone speaks your language and where you can understand where to find everything in the store and where you like the stuff that is for sale to eat? How would you like to live where everything stinks where water comes in a truck once a week or once a month, and, and where you have a pit toilet and scorpions. And all the people, you have no idea whether they're secretly plotting to kill you or they really like you. See, they have all of our problems exponentially. And so we get the privilege, and we've been invited and, uh, since 1998, actually, is the first time that, that, that they shipped me over to talk to religious professionals people that are in the ministry or preparing to be in the ministry and to equip them to stay in the ministry as they're reaching the people of the world. And what God has done around the world that we have seen is this, and, and this is my, um, what I like to call my edgerverse. You've heard me say many times. Uh, when they had come and gathered the church together like we have this morning, they, uh, that's Paul after his first missionary journey, reported all that, now listen, this is what it is, all that God had done, but God uses people. And so God used us to encourage people that are doing things that are hard to describe. So I thought I'd just tell you a few stories, and I'll go by regions around the world. Uh, first of all, the refugees. That's primarily, uh, the refugees are coming from uh, over here in Afghanistan, up there in Syria. Uh, they're coming from North Africa too. And a lot of them are getting uh, either here in Jordan or up in Turkey. As you can see, this is Afghanistan, which is right there. And this is Turkey, which is right there. And there are 2.7 million refugees right now parked in Turkey trying to get in to Europe, through southern Europe, and to get to the promised land. Uh, altogether, at the end of 2015, a year ago, there were just over 4 million of them. Uh, there is an astronomical rise in that. Uh, a lot of them are parked all around here. As I said, almost three million are in Turkey. Uh, Iraq sending them. Syria, as you know, is getting worse by the day. And there are about 1.2 million, a little more than it says right there, in Jordan. But, but what is God doing among the refugees? Well, basically, and what you're going to see in this video clip is, the refugees have Christians among them. And what's amazing is these Christians are seeing this as an opportunity, and they're using that opportunity. With a table of seven Iraqi men, who are refugees. Now, we read about refugees, and we have all these refugees coming in, both from, uh, you know, South and Central America, as well as from the Middle East. And it's just a word, refugees, and it's just a number, you know, how many, 500 a day are, you know, getting in by the Border Patrol. It's amazing to know some personally. And, and I sat at a meal with Iraqi refugees, and I said, I said, good to meet you. Um, where did you live? And and of course, there's a translator, and they went, da, 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 and they said, uh, Mosul. I said, Mosul. They said, you call it Mosul. I said, oh, the ISIS town. They said, yeah. They said, it's Nineveh. I said, Nineveh? They said, Nineveh. They said, that's, that's the capital of Assyria that Jonah went to, that still Mosul is Nineveh of the Bible times. And I thought, I'm looking at descendants of the gospel ministry of the unwilling missionary Jonah. And here are these seven families that were normal. When you think of refugees, they were normal people with normal jobs living just like we do every day. One of them was a plumber. One of them was an art teacher in secondary education. Another one was a, uh, not English, must be Iraqi or Arabic teacher. I mean, but whatever. They, they all were normal people, had normal jobs, and they got the word that ISIS was coming toward Mosul. 
And the word was, in 12 hours, they'll be on the outskirts of the city. And we don't know whether they're trying to encircle the city. So you have 12 hours if you don't want to live under ISIS rule. Well, those seven families, it would be like, it's 1102 right now. How would you like to leave your house at 1102 tonight? Never to return and to only take with you what you could carry, what would you take? Well, they said the first thing we did is we put our children in the car. Well, that was good. Then they had to decide, were they taking food or blankets? Were they taking furniture or books? Were they taking photo albums or what? And they had 12 hours to be gone. And when they left Mosul, they went to Jordan, the only safe island in the whole region, and they became refugees. So once you become a refugee, you're in no man's land. You don't have a passport. You're in a foreign country. They got into Jordan, and they're living in the refugee camps. The Jordanian government has, has graciously made housing for 1.2 million of these people in these massive camps, and they're just... They're just cubicles, it's cement cubicles, like apartment buildings, that don't even, a lot of them have windows. A lot of them don't have electricity. A lot of them don't have running water. And, and they basically are camping in a cement cube as a whole family from now on. And I thought, oh, that's, that puts a different face on refugees. And so I said, so what are you doing? And they said, we're going to seminary. I said, you're, you're going here to seminary? Why? They said, because we can't go back to our country. We don't have passports, and they'll kill us anyway. And we can't work here because the Jordanian government doesn't have jobs for 1.2 million refugees. And so they said, we are going to go to this seminary because we live in 1.2 million refugees that all speak our language. They're all hopeless. They all have nothing. They're all in their little cubes. They're all despondent. They all think their life has ended, and we have hope. And I thought, wow. Is that how we think? We lose our job and our world falls in. And God might allow us to lose our job so that we can minister to people who don't have jobs instead of us being totally seeping in our own grief and sorrow, start thinking outwardly. And that's exactly, I mean, for three hours, what they were asking me is questions for how to minister in the refugee camp because they aren't in seminary yet and they wanted to be ready. 